I'm here today with our great friend, Jennifer Grant. Jennifer is the author of five books for adults, including Love You More, The Divine Surprise of Adopting My Daughter. A new book of evening reflections on nature is called Dimming the Day and releases in October from Broadleaf Books. She also writes for children. Her picture book, Maybe God is Like That Too, won a gold medal from the Moonbeam Spirits Award and was named a Book of the Year finalist in the Forward Indies Awards. Her second picture book, Maybe I Can Love My Neighbor Too, has been named a Junior Library Guild official gold standard selection. Woohoo! <laughs> That's really wonderful. Her third book for children, A Little Blue Bottle, launched in September of 2020, and her newest children's picture book, Once Upon a Time Not So Long Ago, which is a picture book about the pandemic, actually launches today. So how wonderful is that? <laughs> I should also mention that Jennifer has been um, a featured speaker in many of our conferences and a good you know, collaborator on multiple levels. So Jen, it's so wonderful to be here with you to talk about this new book. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So, um, you know, before we get into that, uh, into the new book, maybe for people who aren't as familiar with your work, I mean, talk a little bit about, you know, where you came from as a journalist and the things that you've done. Sure. Um, well, I, I did have for many years, um, I've always been a writer. In college, I studied English and anthropology. And then after college, I got my master's degree in creative writing and critical theory. Um, and always had jobs where they were really writing heavy. So whether it was annual reports or like uh, other, you know, other reports, donor reports for nonprofits and all different, you know, I've written sort of everything you can imagine from poetry to um, the most dry technical stuff to, you know, everything. Um, but yeah, for, for about a dozen years, I wrote a newspaper column and I didn't actually have any journalistic training, but I was just, I happened in on this, this wonderful little gig, writing a weekly newspaper column um, that was mostly about health and family issues. And then at one point I sort of shifted into writing about um, adoption because I was in the adoption process uh, to adopt my youngest, Mia. And um, so, so my column kept sort of changing names and and themes and for a while it was called the red thread and it was about adoption and um, and from that uh, I you know making very long story very short but from that I got an offer to write a book about adoption and specifically about ours and so yeah that book came out it was just my 10-year uh, publishing history or uh, wow. anniversary yeah book birthday so, in yeah in August of 2011 um, love you more came out and then since then, I've written a number of other books for adults, and I haven't really gone back to writing newspaper columns, but all that writing I did and um, just having that regular practice, I think, really helped me. And I think it also really seared on into my brain the importance of meeting deadlines, because when you write for newspapers, you know, there's no kind of asking for two weeks more to write something. So I think it made me pretty disciplined and... and um, really serious about getting deadlines met, even if I'm not loving <laughs> the content as much as I would love to. You know, there's always that terrible disappointment of when you've got an idea for a story or for um, for anything, and to get it onto paper is always such a disappointment because it's so grand and it's so wonderful in your mind, but actually writing it down and then editing it a hundred times is what it takes to make it really good on paper. But um, <laughs> So yeah, so for many years I wrote um, nonfiction and blog posts and a lot of stuff related to health and family and parenting. Um, and then when my kids got a little older, I stopped writing so much about kids because I wanted them, of course, to keep talking to me. And I think if you have tweens or teens and you're writing about, you know, what's really happening in your home, you can either have like really compelling and shocking stories or you can have your kids really trusting and <laughs> uh, telling you what's happening. So I, I opted for the relationship over the content. Um, and then, yeah, a few years ago, I started really focusing more on children's literature and on writing for kids, which um, was something I always wanted to do. And I did write a lot of little stories for my kids um, when they were little, just things that I, you know, wrote down on, you know, computer paper or whatever. But, uh, but it feels like such a privilege to have written 
these, this is my third picture book that's come out. I've got other things in the pipeline that'll be coming out over the next couple of years. But um, yeah, so it's the book birthday for this one. Yay. <laughs> I'm not so long ago. And uh, I'm really, I'm really excited about it uh, going out into the world. And I, I love the illustrations that Jillian Whiting uh, created for this. She is an extremely gifted young illustrator who also illustrated my last picture book, A Little Blue Bottle. And uh, the sensitivity that she brings and also sort of the, the layers to it, she really, she chose a color to kind of represent the virus. And that color is woven throughout the story um, in subtle ways, in really subtle ways. But there's so many, you know, for, for those of us who've spent a lot of time, and I know you have, reading to children, if you read the same book over and over and over, it's always wonderful when there's something that you can kind of, you know, see a rhythm to it or a theme or even a, you know, pictorial theme. And she does such a great job uh, in this book illustrating it. So I'm very excited uh, to celebrate the book birthday with you. Yeah, well, I mean, um, well, first of all, congratulations on all those wonderful things you've written. I mean, I just am thrilled about the fact that you've, I mean, quite frankly, done so well in children's books. Yeah, I mean, the, the ones that you privileged be, before are just awesome. And so is this one. And um, this one in particular, the timeliness of it. Um, so, I mean, it's obviously a difficult thing to have conversations with kids about the issues that we've been through and that's kind of what your book <clears throat> supports mm -hmm. um so maybe you can tell us a little bit about how did the new book come about and mm -hmm. how did you get it out so quickly mm -hmm. well so i started i wrote this actually in march of 2020 and um it was you know for all of us such a disruptive and and frightening and and it was a time where you know, and we're still sort of in the same kind of time, but it was different at the very beginning of sort of lockdown and and understanding the scope of what this pandemic would be. Um, it did feel to me, and I think to most of us, like just the information came over us like a fire hose. You know, it, it, every day there was new information. We went from, you know, people saying that masks wouldn't help to suddenly everyone knew that it was important to wear masks or, you know, there was just so much um, information that changed so quickly. And, and like all of us, I was feeling really upside down. And, uh, and my, I had a child who was a senior in high school and a child who was a senior in college. And I had a, another college uh, daughter who had to come home from school in an instant. You know, she was just told to pack and come home. So everyone was feeling very disrupted and very um, frightened and, and alone and unsure about what life would look like. And um, so I had the idea that I thought, well, how, how will people talk to their young children about this time? And initially I thought about, and I started sketching out a story that was more like sort of a fairy tale and it was going to be more kind of full of metaphor and, and so on. And um, about, you know, like a kingdom that was that, you know, a dragon or something would come and, and change everything the way that this virus had changed our lives so much. And the more I worked on it, the simpler the story got. And so it went from this ornate once upon a time in this kingdom, you know, um, to being just very frank and plainly spoken, saying what this is and what happened and trying to put words to it. And... Um, and it's funny, I, I haven't thought about it since just when, when you asked this question, it, I, it made me think of the fact that um, when we adopted Mia, there is a, um, there's something that in the adoption community, parents are encouraged to create what's called a life book. And a life book is um, a book that kind of tells the child's story on, uh, from their birth to the point of their adoption so that, you know, it's, it can be a mistake if you adopt a child and let's say that child's three to pretend like three is when they came into the world. They had a life, they had a family, they had loss, they had joy, they had all these things from zero right. to three or zero to 10 or whenever they were adopted. And so um, adoptive parents are encouraged to write this life book to kind of give a name to that time that the child had before they were adopted. And in some ways, I think I had a similar impulse with this in that I knew that there would be little kids that um, would hear this spoken about or 
know that it, you know, have vague memories of, of their parents suddenly working from home or their, their siblings suddenly taking school from home and having all their groceries delivered or just how things changed in a heartbeat. Um, and I thought I would like to put a name on this and also to kind of look aspirationally toward the future. So this does look for, to a time when we've, you know, it doesn't say that the pandemic's over, but it does indicate that things got better. Um, and just to sort of say, this is, this is how we can start to talk about it. We can say what happened. We can give kids a simple, relatable story. Um, and then we can tell our own stories, you know, we can, and we can listen to their stories about how they, you know, encountered this. And it's funny because more recently I've spent some time with um, the grandchildren of different friends that I have who are young and the ones who are like five and six and seven talk about this and goof around with their masks. And, you know, they, they um, have a sort of, they have a way to talk about what's happened. But what's interesting to me is the kids who are like two and two and a half years old have a real fear. All the ones I've encountered, I mean, I've seen, I see it a lot even in my neighborhood walking around where somebody comes by with a stroller and there's an older kid and a younger kid and the older kid will say hi and the little kid looks a little frightened. Mm -hmm. And I think for those really little kids, you know, maybe one and a half to three, they haven't been socialized in the same way as their older siblings. And so they've, they've been really at home with. The same yeah. Kids. Yeah. And we've not talked about it with our children about that phenomenon. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And, and so I didn't think of this when I was writing this, I didn't have the foresight to think, Oh, what about little kids who are born now? And, you know, don't have, you know, they think this is what life is always like. And so in a way, I hope this will be a gift for parents of kids in that little uh, cohort as well, in that they could, you know, begin to tell them, yeah, something happened, and here's here's how we can talk about that together, and here's how we can process this together. Um, so I hope, I my hope is that it'll be a gift to those kids as well. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so did one of the publishing houses reach out to you to, to no, do this book or you no, no, actually no. went through yeah. a typical pitch the proposal process? Yeah. 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 So I wrote it. So first I started with that fairy tale and I wrote that for a week or two. <laughs> and um, then I decided that that wasn't really working and I kept stripping it down to this story <clears throat> and to this very plain uh, description of what's, what was happening. And then, yeah, then I wrote a proposal and my agent sent it around and um, I ended up uh, going with um, our, our friend, uh, Milton Brasher Cunningham is the editor and he really connected with it immediately and uh, he was excited to do it. And, and he said, you know, what we'll do is we'll, because it's so early, this was April, let's say of 2020, and he said, there's so much unknown about what this pandemic will continue to do. And so he said, what we'll do is we'll have Jillian begin illustrations. And then it was great. I was able to work closely with her again um, on this one and on different concepts and ideas. And he said, but then, of course, we'll know that by the time we're in, like, sort of the poured pages are ready, we can make changes if something's not accurate, you know, or historically accurate. But actually, it's, it's kind of... Um, we didn't need to change anything um, because it's such a simple story. I didn't say, you know, and then after 12 months, everything was perfect, you know, or, or whatever. It's really more about talking about loss and resilience and about, um, about the way that we've really learned how to adapt and also how to loving, love each other from afar and in, you know, close by. Jillian created, um, I love this page. This, the text on this page is just people learned to do things in new ways. And she created this beautiful, you know, uh, spread of people um, using phones and screens. And I love the, um, the positivity of it and the warmth. She's so gifted at, at uh, showing people's emotions and, and yes, the, warmth that, absolutely. the warmth that can be even communicated when you are on a screen, you know? And so, um, so yeah, it, 
I was really, I was thrilled that Milton took a chance with this and um, that he understood it and that he saw the value in it. And um, well, now I'm even more impressed at how quickly it came out with that fact that it wasn't like, you know, requested by a publishing house, you know, so right. that's, that's really great that, you know, you and they were able to get it out so quickly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also, you know, what, what you were describing in terms of, you know, your working relationship with the illustrator, mm-hmm. from what I've gathered is really not standard Correct. for children's yeah. books. Some yeah. of the authors that I talk to don't even know or have never spoken with, uh-huh. you know, maybe until mm-hmm. after the book's published or something. Mm-hmm. You know I mean? So yours is a much different situation. It is. It's very different. It's very unique that I've been able to work with her twice. And actually, we're working on a third project right oh, now. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. But what happened was when um, Milton bought a little blue bottle, he did have an illustrator in mind, someone whom they work with at, at church publishing. And that person actually had to withdraw from the project because of, it, of a busy schedule or something like that. And so um, that was all set. And then Milton said, oh, sorry, um, there's a little delay. The illustrator is not able to do the project. And, and I said, oh, well, I know someone. And <laughs> I've known Jillian. Um, I've seen her work since she was about five years old. She grew up. She's the oh same age. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. She is actually the same age as one of my kids. And so they went all the way through high school together, from kindergarten to high school. Oh, my goodness. And, I didn't realize this. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Jillian's mom actually was a very dear friend of mine. She sadly died of cancer a couple of years ago, but, um, but all through Jillian's upbringing, you know, and her childhood, her mom and I would be out to breakfast or, you know, hanging out together and she'd pull out her phone and say, Oh, you've got to see what Jillian's made. You've got to see this. (laughs) And so I've been a big fan of Jillian's artwork (laughs) since she was about, you know, six years old. And, um, she was an illustration major in college. So she, Mm she was learning all the things that a children's illustrator needs to learn about how to set up a page so that there's, it's composed in a way that text can be, you know, featured in a, in a good way, you know, all that stuff, things that we don't even think about as non illustrators, but she was in college in her senior year when the, when she did a little blue bottle and, you know, she had all the equipment, she had all the, you know, she had wonderful professors and she was able to talk with them and, she and I met a lot when she was doing the illustrations for that one. So it is very unique that I get to work with her so often. Yes. And so, yeah, with this one, I asked, you know, Milton when, when he loved the story, I said, I'd really love to work with Jillian again. And he said, absolutely. You know, and so, you well, know, kudos, kudos yeah. to him and to church publishing for allowing that, because I don't mm-hmm. know that every publishing house, you know, even if their initial illustrator went away mm-hmm. would accept, um, yeah you know, yeah. hey, how about, how about my illustrator? You know, here's yeah. how about my suggestion? Well, and she's so gifted. And, you know, I encourage anyone listening to look, look her up online, Jillian Whiting Illustration. She has so many different styles. And the thing, what she's working on now with us is uh, very different, more like mm. uh, pen and ink kind of drawings. Um, but these are, in both of the picture books we've done so far, Her she's just got these ornate, beautiful emotionally um stunning i mean you know especially well with both of them but a little blue bottle as you know is about grief and she so captures the grief that this yes, little girl is going through absolutely and in this one there's there's such a warmth um in some of the interactions that the that the characters have in this book and yeah i think she, i mean i could go on and, and as <laughs> i said i've been i've been her fan since she was a little girl so yeah <clears throat> Well, you know how um, I work with authors on their elevator pitch, you mm-hmm. know, and tell them how important it is for them to be very crisply, succinctly mm-hmm. convey to someone why mm-hmm. their book matters, you know, or what, mm-hmm. what the, the big theme is, you know, the why mm-hmm. they should buy their book. So if you had to say in one sentence, mm-hmm. you know, why should someone be interested in Once Upon a Time Not So Long Ago, what would you mm-hmm. say? I would say that for both children and adults, and this is going to be longer than one sentence, but it's okay. Both, That's okay. Uh, but for both children, what I've heard, the feedback I've gotten from people as well is that for adults and for children, this, this time of dealing with COVID-19 has been, 
you know, heartbreaking, confusing, disruptive. Um, it's made us, it's made our concept of time very difficult. Like I still like, I'll think, oh, it's August, you know? Um, and, and this book, the, the power I think in this book is its simplicity. And so it, um, it names and gives, uh, it places this thing in a time frame. It places this, this experience, this shared experience we've had, um, it puts words to it in a simple way. And it also, another thing that Jillian and I both wanted to do was show that this is a global experience. Mm -hmm. And so as you look through these pages, it's the whole world. You know, it's not, this isn't an American story or, uh, you know, North American story. This, this, this book shows people all over the world dealing with it, which I hope will point to our common humanity um, and also show that, yeah, what, what we all, you know, you, you are passionate about healing our divides, you know, and this book in some ways points to the way we are all the same. We love our families. We, we love being in person and together with the people we love. And that is shown over and over again in this book that what really matters is, is this love that we share with the people in our lives, you know? And so, yeah, I think, I hope it's just a way to, and, and then the publisher, and it's interesting, um, I wasn't for this initially, but they wanted to add these journal pages at the end. Mm. And so there's a few blank pages at the end with prompts that say, like, you know, what will you, what will you remember about this time? And um, what good things happened to you during these days? What did you miss the most during this time? And I, I was sort of, I pushed back a little bit about that because I thought, oh, I don't want, you know, it's a picture book. It's really made to be read. It's not made to be drawn in or written in. And they made the very good case that it was a way of honoring the story of the people who are reading it. And so it's a kind of book where a child could then write down and then later in life, look back on it. And yes, go, oh, that's yes what I, exactly. You know? And I was speaking to a friend who's, who got an early copy and, and she um, her children read it and really loved the book. I was delighted to know, but um, they were already filling in and saying, okay, the good time, the good things about this time were one, one kid said, I got more cookies and I got more screen time, <laughs> <laughs> but that's so cute. And also yeah, maybe well, not a the reality. Yeah. And, and that might not be a detail that boy would remember in 10 years <laughs> writing it down in this keepsake way. So I think they're, I think that the publisher is hoping that this will be something like a grandparent might give to a grandchild and then they'd be able to talk about their shared experience of this time and then also record it and then have that as kind of a record of this, you know, so. Well, excellent. Excellent. Um, so I mentioned in the beginning that you've got another book coming out in October for adults mm -hmm. um, and we're, we'll do another interview where we talk about that in depth. Um, oh, when you. launch time comes, but um, for now, can you give us a little bit of a sneak peek? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so that book is called Dimming the Day, and um, and interestingly, I wrote that concurrent with writing this book. Um, I had uh, I had written a proposal for it, and the my idea was that so many of us end end the day sort of scrolling through our phones and feeling anxious, and we had all the uh, anxiety around the election, around um, just climate change, you know, all these different things, even before the pandemic. And, um, and I thought, what would, you know, I had read that uh, when we experience wonder and awe, that kind of turns off anxiety in our, in our brains. And so I thought, what, what kind of things make me feel wonder and awe? And it's always, mm -hmm. for me, it's almost always something in nature. And so Dimming the Day has 20 chapters with, um, each chapter has a different topic, like uh, ginkgo trees, humpback whales, uh, hummingbirds, all these things that I find really wonderful. And so it has a lot of scientific information about those different things in nature, and then ends with some prompts for sleep, kind of mindfulness prompts and um, just different ways to reflect on these things that are so much greater and grander than the problems that we have or our social media feeds and all that stuff. And so the idea is to end the day, 
you know, just experiencing a sense of wonder about things that are real and bigger than us and older than us and, and beautiful things in nature. So I'm excited about that one. Yes, absolutely. Very, very cool. So we'll talk about that more when the time comes, but uh, I mean, you know, Jen, you're so productive, you know, you, <laughs> you, you do so many things. I haven't even mentioned to folks yet that you do freelance editing too. Mm-hmm. So that's another area where we collaborate is that, you know, I'll send some folks your way and you'll work with them to, you know, refine their books. Mm-hmm. And so uh, you, you do juggling and you do <laughs> uh, writing and you do editing. And it's like um, just such a pleasure to, to see all your great work, Jen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And so um, people can go to jennifergrant.com. Mm-hmm. You, get, you got the, the right domain name without an initial <laughs> in the middle even. Just okay. Jennifer, jennifergrant.com for, for a common name you, you struck early. So that was really <laughs> good. Uh, so you can go there. And then <clears throat> for the freelance editing that I mentioned uh, on the Writing for Your Life website, uh, there's a writer services section. And you can you know find Jennifer's uh, offers there. And um, we're soon going to be having um, a children's book conference online in October that Jen will be part of, and she'll be doing some manuscript review service um, as part of that conference as well. So um, hallelujah for uh, all your (laughs) wonderful work and our opportunity to collaborate. Well, thank you. I I love working with you and with with the Writing for Your Life community. And it's been fun the last few years seeing some of the same names pop up, you know, especially on these Zoom, when we're doing a Zoom channel or whatever, to see people who are really growing in their careers and, and, um, you know, coming back again and again and, and moving their projects forward. It's been really fun. Well, some of the book interviews I've been able to do with, you know, some of our alum, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. alumni, people that attended a conference and Mm -hmm. published a book. (laughs) It's like, what a concept. It's a wonderful thing. (laughs) Yeah. Well, Jen, thanks again, and congratulations, and uh, again, the, the title of this book that we were just talking about is Once Upon a Time, Not So Long Ago, so you can find it, you know, anywhere uh, fine books are sold. <laughs> so, yeah. Jen, thanks so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>